This is Tim Pierce. That was David Grissom playing exquisitely and getting an exquisite tone. And the, the exquisite tone comes from the fact that he spent 20 years working on the sound of that guitar. Uh, that's his signature guitar. We interviewed David. He talks about it. And it's a deeper story than I thought because he actually, as the predecessor to that, he helped develop the original McCarty, the PRS McCarty. And then after that, that led into his signature. I mean, he tried 40 different pickup combinations in that guitar. He had other guitar players weigh in for almost a decade before finally perfecting it. And when that led me to a secondhand guitar. We're gonna look at that. We'll, we'll hear more of David playing and we'll have the interview with David straight away. Click the link below for the online masterclass. There's a 14 day free trial, so you can check it out and see if it's right for you. Also below, very important, is the link for the newsletter so we can let you know every time we release a new video. I bought this second hand from a very nice gentleman in Carbondale, Pennsylvania, named John Price. And he listed all the specifications, and I showed them to Grissom, and he said, yeah, it's a good one. He, David didn't know about the pickups, because they're brand new, but that's an easy thing to change, although I'm sure it will. Uh, also, the specs were really important on this. John listed it at 7.15 pounds, so it was under eight pounds. So that really interested me. I like lighter guitars. And so I'm hoping they simply packed. John's kind of a pro, I guess, in the business and sold guitars before. So it was really good to deal with. And I had never been interested in blue guitar, but all of a sudden, about six months ago, I took a liking to blue, and it was kind of crazy. But I got obsessed with blue. And then when I did David's interview, I, I just got obsessed with David's guitar. And here we go. Ooh, oh, yeah. Ah, it's light. So there you go. Super 10 top. Not private stock, but you could fool me, certainly. And let's see how it plays. Plays easy. Oh, I love the tram, it floats. Hmm. Gotta take it upstairs to the studio and put it through its paces. I was at a guitar show in Dallas and uh, I met Paul and I think he uh, heard me playing and I'm like, somebody introduced me to him. You're the Paul Reed Smith. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, he heard me play and he goes, and I told him I bought a guitar. And I think he said, I'll give you a guitar in any parts you need. Yeah, it was, you know, and I'm like, wow, somebody's giving me a guitar. That kind of started it and, you know, like sure enough, 10 days later, I can still remember the, the sound of the UPS truck pulling up in front of my apartment. I knew which day it was going to arrive. And I lived in a, you know, a small apartment in South Austin. And I can remember this, that truck pulling up and uh, it was amazing. You know, wow. I understand that you wanted more of a Dwayne Allman kind of tone. So you actually started developing a guitar with PRS, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Around 90, 90-ish, 90 91. I mean, I played I played the standard and then the go he gave me a gold top through all these, you know, five years with Joe Ely. And then when I joined Mellicamp's band, the gold top was still my main guitar. And 
those guitars were really mid-rangey and we love mid-range as guitar players mid-range speaks through the band and and uh but it was almost uh p90 ish and i kept wanting to get a little more Dwayne at the Fillmore, that open PAF thing where oh, the upper harmonics yeah. sort of, yeah. uh, you know, like a cloud rise out of the note a little bit. And um, we added an, uh, a little more extra mahogany on the back of the guitar to try and change that ratio to, of maple to mahogany to try to maybe make it a little uh, warmer and a little more low end. I was looking for a little more low end as well. <laughs> staring at the guitar right now um the, the thing that blows me away is that this actually was the development of the mccarty correct 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 why don't yeah please pick it up and show us yeah it's uh this is it Ooh. and um it's near and dear to my heart it reminds me of what how lucky i am to have had the relationship with paul and prs for that long, but also the time, what was happening in my life at the time. So what we did was we added the extra, about an, it was either an eighth or a quarter of an inch, I can't remember, of mahogany on to the back, this to the, to the mahogany section of the guitar. Um, it was the first PRS with vintage style lightweight tuners. And the headstock, this headstock angle, which was more uh, extreme than what they had been doing. Uh, the pickups, the first, this is, I think, the first PRS that ever had pickup covers. And um, we used two, basically, neck, they're the exact same output. So it's very much like, you know, an old PF. You know, like the, he gives them, they just reached into a box and grabbed a pickup and soldered it in. It wasn't like, oh, the bridge needs to be hotter. They made me the twin to this with a tremolo about three or four months later, which I still have, too. And um, around 2004, I was making these changes. I was changing the frets. I was, we tweaked the pickups. We tweaked the tuners again. And Paul said, man, you want to do a signature model? There's so many different things going on here. Oh, I see. So you were still customizing and customizing and tweaking yeah. and perfecting before you right. even talked about a signature guitar. Well, yeah, it was an ongoing thing. And I was doing all these sessions in Nashville and I would, you know, put my, I, I would, show it to Kenny Greenberg or Pat Buchanan or whatever. And they were like, well, man, if I could get this guitar, I'd, I'd play, you know, a PRS. I had a 59 burst and I stress had, which is like, almost makes me break out into a sweat that I, <laughs> I sold it five years too early. But, uh, you know, I took it to 25 sessions and always tried to get an opportunity to do a blind AB with the PRS, with the engineer. And never once did they prefer the burst. Right. So, you know, you, I can make these guitars sound just like a Les Paul, but as you know, certain producers want the Les Paul. I understand that your DGT signature guitar actually is inspired by your two favorite vintage guitars, which are your, is it a 53 Tele? It's a 52. 
52, and your your favorite 335, which I think is you told me is a 59. It's a 59, yeah. And that the 59 335 was kind of the reason I sold the burst because it could, it just it blew the burst out of the water. The two tones I chased my whole life were Dwayne at the Fillmore, and then the first two Roy Buchanan records, which ah. are radically different to me than the ones that followed. The tone he got with the the black guard through the Vibralux cranked up was with all that reverb and um, really all, those two sounds kind of were, you know, of course, a thousand other wonderful tones too. But for some reason, uh, those uh, warm bridge pickup tones really grabbed me. I think you told me also that you actually filled in for Dickie Betts with the Allman Brothers for three weeks, and and that was one of your funnest. You've been touring with Mellencamp, which yeah. is you know required all of the compromises of being a sideman. And when you went on the road with the Allman Brothers, you went, "Wow, boy, do I love music!" Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the the three years I spent with with John, I wouldn't trade for anything. I, it was an amazing education. The band was unbelievable. There were so many high points about it. Having the opportunity to work with John in the studio, brilliant. I mean, the way he took these three chord folk songs and made them into these anthemic, you know, these these rock anthems. The live shows were very orchestrated, almost like theater. As you, as you know, big rock shows. I mean, you were working with lighting directors and cues and everything, and of course, not a whole lot of room. There, I had a couple spots to play, but it was his deal. You know, I was the side man, no big deal. It was great. But at the end of kind of the third year I was working with John, I got a call, random phone call. Can you come out and play? My wife called me. I was flying home and said, can you, the Almond Brothers called and wondered if you can come out and fill in for Dickie Betts. And I'm like, ha ha, ha, yeah, ha, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. No, she goes, R really? <laughs> and uh, so, oh, that was before cell phones. So I immediately called and got an answering machine. And by the time I got to Austin, they got somebody else. And apparently that didn't work out because the next day I get the call again and I, you know, can you be on a flight in three hours? And so got everything together, flew to DC. They picked me up on the curb at midnight on, in the tour bus. And the next night we played Meriwether Post Pavilion. Crazy. You, did you have to prep a lot for it? You probably knew a lot of the songs already. I knew, I knew, I mean, there was three or four songs I'd never heard, but basically the repertoire in high school, I was like, you know, a disciple of those records. And we had a 45 minute sound check. I mean, there was literally, I got the call and literally went home and got my guitar, went back, went to the airport and flew out. And it's so crazy. I, we had a 45 minute sound check for me and Warren Haynes to say who's part, who's playing the, you know, which harmony part. Basically, that was what, because, you know, everything, all these twin lines, these harmony lines throughout. And uh, that was it. That was, there was no, there was never another sound check, rehearsal or anything. And a couple of times we, you know, they, they were, uh, they would, they like the song Hot Lana, da 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 We never played it. And one, we were doing this outdoor show somewhere. I can't remember where it was, but like 15 minutes before we, before we go on, Warren says, hey, we're going to do Hot Lana. And I'm like, uh oh can I, can I do a quick refresher I mean, you know like re really quick because it, but that's the way they operated and it was it was so refreshing you know you get the like the five minute call and everybody just kind of gets to the side of the stage and then okay lights go down you walk out tune up and and then it's just three hours of it, it was very much like a jazz gig in that you know the first the first night i'm playing you know it was just almost kind of 
first time I'd ever experienced playing for 20,000 people and you play a, a really long guitar solo and the crowd applauds after the solo, like the, if you were at the Village Vanguard. And it's also the first time anybody told me I need to play longer solos. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, it, it was awesome. The experience to actually play with a band that in high school when you're dreaming of become, you know, when music is everything and you dream, you know, what, not, you know, just to go see the Alvin Brothers. And then, you know, I mean, I, I honestly would every now and think about, man, what, what, God, if I could to play with them, what that would be like. I mean, I don't know if that was in a dream or a daydream or whatever, but then I, I was doing it and, it and it was just, it was surreal and euphoric and really brought me back to very, it was, it, you know, the way we made music with Joe Ely where every night was different. Well, you, you know, one, one of the things that really surprised me and kind of delighted me is that you told me you were on the bridge pickup 90% of the time and you get a myriad of tones out of that. And I think you do it by turning the volume down and maybe adding a pedal. Can you talk about that a little bit? And it's also pick and fingers, choosing between pick and fingers, right? It's very difficult to set the amp and your rig to where the neck pickup and the bridge pickup are exactly how you want them. The way the pickups are designed and the amps I choose and the sort of manipulation of the volume control and how I use my hands and a couple of pedals, I can cover almost everything with the bridge pickup. It's very rare on my gig that I even go to the neck pickup. a perfect segue into your artist career. You make lots of records and you tour a lot, particularly in Europe. And you were telling me that it's easier for you to break even and maybe make money in Europe because the cities are closer together. Yeah, right? it's definitely just the proximity of, of the towns. I mean, America's huge. And um, there's also an appreciation, I think, for um, American guitar players still that it, it's something that is sort of unique uh, to our experience that I think that appeals to uh, European audiences. And a normal travel day is never usually longer than two or three hours. And you can set up these tours where I'm playing six or seven nights a week. And, and it's not like you're going to the airport or, or in a, overnighting in a tour bus. I mean, you're sleeping in a hotel bed every night, uh, almost every night. And uh, so it for some reason, it's just, I mean, it's just much more difficult to tour in the States. And I feel terrible. I get emails from people. Why aren't you coming to Philly? Why aren't you coming to Phoenix? And I'm like, because it'll cost me about 5000 or $10,000 to do it. And I'm not really in the position to do that. So when the world opens up, you're going to be right back out there. And you're going to be touring for a lot of years in Europe and making a lot more records and feeling that same feeling you felt when you were filling in for D Dickie Betts and the Almond Brothers. I know it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I hope so. I was, uh, obviously, I mean, I put out a live record May 1st, uh, and I was supposed to be going to Europe this summer and tour behind that record. And I mean, obviously, we're all on hold. We're all in the same boat, no sob story, no no self-pity or sad stories going right now. But your only sob story is that you're doing too many sessions at home. Uh, you, well, you, you told me you're doing a lot of sessions at home for people right now. They're sending you the files and you're turning them around. Yeah, it's awesome. My espresso machine's just across the driveway and uh, nobody's looking over my shoulder. It's um, fantastic. I love it. But um, 
yeah, playing with my own band is this is, is really the same feeling as the Allman Brothers. And after all these years of being a side man, to really open it up every night and have that improv, you know, keep that improvising part of your brain working, that's the thing. I'm, you know, it's hard to practice when we're in this situation. But yeah, I love it. Well, thanks, David. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please hit the subscribe button and ring the bell. If you are a subscriber, please ring the bell. It lets us let you know every time a new video is released. You can also support us by clicking the link below for the online masterclass. As I always say, we're up to over 100 hours of lessons and content, over a thousand videos. There's a 14-day free trial. Take your time, take a long look. We'd love to have you join us.